Hi, my name is Dominic Trabasi, and I am a first-year student at Moravian College. What you're about to hear is an interview with Dr. Neil Wetzel, the Associate Professor of Music at Moravian. So this interview was originally an assignment for my first-year writing seminar class, but I ended up liking the interview so much that, with Dr. Wetzel's permission, I decided to post it on the internet for all to enjoy. So huge shout out to Dr. Wetzel for lending me his valuable time and allowing me to talk with him way longer than I had first anticipated. Um, so without further ado, here is the Dr. Wetzel interview. I guess I could just start with where did your love for music really begin? Was it like a first instrument, first performance, like some piece that you heard? I think it was kind of a family thing because all of my older brothers and sisters played in the band. They were they were They were all much older than me. My oldest sister was like... 17 or 18 when I was born and she was already playing in the band and my the next sister played in the band and the next brother was a drummer and my next two brothers were my twin brothers both played the trombone so it was just sort of like right family tradition it's what right? we do yeah yeah and it's interesting because when I was oh I had I wanted a drum I really wanted a drum <laughs> I wanted to be a drummer I was like drums is for me and then my family, when I was maybe in kindergarten, mm -hmm. bought me a toy drum. And apparently I played it so much that one of my siblings destroyed it. Oh. <laughs> Literally, so that I would stop what, playing Because they it. got sick of hearing it. Yeah. Because yeah. they got sick of hearing me play. And interestingly enough, for years it was blamed on my baby brother, who was two months or two years, a year and a half younger than me. Mm -hmm. And I only found out like about five years ago that it was really one of my older brothers that did it. Yeah. He finally f confessed that he wow. destroyed it because he was just tired of hearing. Anyway, so then when I was in fourth grade, they bought me a toy saxophone. Mm -hmm. And so when they came to fourth grade, or actually that was third grade, then fourth grade, I was like, well, I'm going to sign up for saxophone lessons because I know how to play the saxophone right. already. Well, I didn't know how to play the saxophone, but it was always something that I was really good at and excelled at, um, and I didn't really even work that hard at it. I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to say now, uh, and so I just was always a band geek, right? Almost from the beginning. Was it just from like being surrounded by it that you? Fit I in think so. so. And then I think the people that were in the band. I mean, some of my my best friend from high school and elementary school. We started saxophone together the same when I was 10 years old so it was like we were always it just made sense it just made sense it was just yeah. like and I remember going into high school before I went into high school and thinking well I'm not making up what would I do and it was like there was nothing else that came to me as far as a job other than music yeah and then I went to school for performance I didn't want to do music ed because I didn't want to be thought of as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And then I got out and I was performing and doing a little bit of teaching and found out that I was a pretty good teacher. So I was like, all right, this is all right. And then I got my master's in education and my doctorate in education, in music education. I see. It's funny. I never really thought about... That's not true. For a minute, I thought about being a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> where, where does that come from? I think it's because my... my my father grew up on a chicken farm. My mother grew up on a dairy. You I know, see. at one point in rural areas, everybody were farmers. Right. Even if they had another job at a factory somewhere, they still farmed. Yeah. So your first was what was it? Your first real instrument, like that you actually studied, was saxophone. saxophone. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And you originally wanted to be a drummer. Yeah, you... Originally, yeah. But by the time I started saxophone, that was like not an option anymore. Right. But you don't play drums now, or do you... I do enough to kind of teach a couple of basic. Things. Right. Right. Okay. I, I use it for my jazz methods class. I teach them how to do a swing beat. Right. Can you is, can you give me a list of all the instruments that you're able to play okay. to a proficient level? So I can get a sound and play simple melodies on probably most anything. Right. But the, tune, the, the instruments that I play professionally on, right. saxophone, mm -hmm. flute, and clarinet. And all mm -hmm. the saxophones. Alto, tenor, baritone, soprano, mm -hmm. um, flute, piccolo. I've done gigs on regular clarinet, on bass clarinet, um, and that's primarily my professional. I can play a little bit of piano enough to accompany my students. Um, I know enough brass instruments to teach it. Um, I know enough string instruments to be a little bit dangerous and harmful to people's ears. <laughs> enough to teach. Right. Because when I did my Master of Arts in teaching, I had to do techniques classes on all the instruments mm -hmm. in order to teach them. Is there anything that you can't play that you wish you could? I'll tell you, you know what I would love to play really well? Yeah. I would love to play pedal steel guitar. 
I think that is a cool instrument. Pedal steel guitar? Pedal steel guitar, yeah. Have you ever heard pedal steel no. guitar? Like you listen to old vintage um, uh, Hank Williams. Okay. And you listen to that pedal steel guitar and Patsy Cline, vintage. Uh, you listen to those pedal steel players who, even though it's cla- it's vintage country, I'm talking like 40s, 50s, maybe mm-hmm. 60s, even though that's like classic country, so much of what the pedal steel players was really kind of jazz based. And their language and their lines. Very interesting. Hmm. So was it was it in college that you, or was it before that you realized that like, did you always know that this was something you were gonna do? Like for yes. sure. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. Even I remember it was either ninth or tenth grade that we had to do as part of one of our classes. We had to come up with a budget and how we would <laughs> how how we would live, make a living. And I remember putting together a model of me being a performer and a teacher, kind of pretty much what I've been doing the last 40 some years yeah. of teaching and performing and doing gigs. Back then, my parents used to watch this show called The Lawrence Welk Show. And the, you, you're way too young. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe your grandparents watch it. Maybe My parents, I remember watching, they used to watch it almost every week. This was like a big hit. And it was this big band orchestra that used to do like a variety show. And my goal was to play for The Lawrence Welk Show. Mm-hmm. Many years I did play, not on television, but in concert for the stars of the Lawrence Welk show. Wow. So I got actually got to play it. Um, but yeah, so I've done a lot of different kind of gigging, but that's pretty much, it's funny. I've, like I said, I never really thought of doing much of anything else since I was like ninth or 10th grade. And you've definitely like, you've gotten what you wanted. Yes. It's, it seems like you've done it relatively easily too. Cause it's no. Like, no, no, not easily. <laughs> okay. So then, well, well, so tell, tell me about your struggles then. Like what, what what's probably what, what was what are some of the low points in your music career? I don't know if I would call them low points. Right. I think they were turning points. Mm-hmm. Um, when I went to college, mm. I went to the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, which is a conservatory. Mm-hmm. So they have very very few liberal arts courses, and the right. idea is they load you up. They have minimum liberal arts. I maybe took four or five, maybe six liberal arts, not even. I never took a math class, never took a science class, never wow. took a um, foreign language. Mm-hmm. They didn't have those requirements. There were a few composition courses, an aesthetics course, maybe three or four, for, for all four years. Right. But everything was music, music history, music theory, music performance. And I remember going there, and the whole goal of a conservatory is to get people to be professional playing musicians. Mm-hmm. My wife, that's where I met my wife. And so there was a turning point, I remember, when I was there at school, my first year, and I remember going to my saxophone teacher, and up to that point, I was practicing about an hour a day. That was a good day. If I had a fabulous day of practicing, it was two hours. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to my saxophone teacher and saying, "Um, you know, how much should I be practicing? I'm a saxophone major. How much? He says, well, you should do an hour of tone exercises, an hour of scales, an hour or two of etudes that I assign, and another two to three hours of repertoire. Mm -hmm. Then (laughs) you should practice your jazz tunes, your jazz repertoire, your jazz. Uh And on the the outside, I stood there and I shook my head and said, okay, okay. And on the inside, I was like, what? He just listed like five, six, seven, eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. And I realized that... I mean, it didn't happen like right that moment. I was kind of thinking about this and thinking, all right, I'm at a conservatory. All I've got is music classes. I've got hours to practice. Why aren't I practicing? Do I want to practice? How am I going to get to practice like that? And so I remember thinking to myself, there was, I remember this moment thinking, well, I want to practice more. I want to get better. Okay. That's a given. I want to, and there's a lot of saxophone players here at this school as a freshman that are much better than me. Hmm. And so I want to practice. So what's keeping me from practice? And I realized that my own attitude was keeping me from practicing. And I realized, and I think this was kind of pretty important shift for a kid that was 18 years old. I thought to myself, all right, I want to practice, but I have this attitude about practicing that I don't want to practice. And part of it is, it was very, I manifested itself like, Somebody would say to me after class, like after musicianship in the morning, they say, hey, you want to go get a pizza or you want to get coffee? And I'd say, no, I have to go practice. Right. And I decided, you know, maybe if I just changed my attitude and said, I want to go practice because that's really what I want to do. Mm-hmm. 
And then that's what I did. And people say, hey, do you want to go out and get a pizza? Do you want to get coffee? I'd say, no, I want to practice. And I was practicing two hours a day. Next semester, I was practicing three hours a day. By the time I got up to be a senior, I was practicing five, six, seven, eight hours a day. And that's what the really, I don't want to say me as a great player, but people like Charlie Parker, that's what they did. Right. That's what, uh, these are famous saxophone players. Yeah. That's what Michael Brecker did. Mm -hmm. You know, they just decided, hey, so I'm gonna, now, I don't expect all of my students to do that. But if you really want to play, it's, it's very simple how to become a really great player. It's not easy. Right. So that was a, a point for me. And, you know, I think you were asking about low points. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I think I have regular low points where I go to a gig and I like come an away. Or just like, wow, you know, I really didn't play. I really didn't play as well as I think I could. Right. And I think that happens for all musicians. Right. Yeah. I think sometimes that's why it manifests for some musicians in using drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. It's a way of not dealing with those feelings. And I think it's a very common thing to like even come away from a rehearsal or a performance and just sort of be like, oh, wow. You know, I really, that, that, that heartbreak of, wow, I really feel like I could play better. And there are some times that I feel the opposite, where I feel like, wow, okay, this was a good night. I felt good tonight. But I think that's part of sort of the struggle of being an artist, musician, mm -hmm. of always feeling like... You could the, have been better. It could have been better. I'm right. the imposter. They're going to find out that, that I'm not good. That could also be a good as, thing. Well, of course. Then it, if you use that as a, a right. motivation to right. work harder next time. And, and quite honestly, that keeps me practicing. So I have a right. gig on tomorrow. Hmm. It's like with this big band up in uh, the Water Gap. The Water Gap big band. It's good luck. great players with... Thank you. Great players from New York. It's a great band with great soloists. And yeah. I remember one night that, that and there's that constant struggle that you deal with when you're a musician of, you know, oh my gosh, this is a disaster, or wow, how can I do this? I remember one night I was playing with that band, and a world class musician, David uh, Liebman was playing with the band. He was a featured soloist. He's another tenor saxophone player. He literally sat right in front of me. I reached forward and mm -hmm. touched him on the back of his head. Yeah. And the first tune was, he's a world-class, very famous player. Right. And the first tune, it was going to be a tenor battle, saxophone battle between him and I, featured oh, solos. Wow. Right? And I remember having this conversation in my head of, okay, don't try to do Dave Liebman. Just try to do Neil Wetzel. Right. You know, and thinking, and, and then just this very interesting conversation. I remember this very, the very conscious kind of inner conversation that I had. And feeling like, all right, I held my own. I didn't try to do what I can't do. Or sometimes I play and I think about, I'm sorry, I'm going over, aren't I? No, you're, no, you're, okay. no, please continue. Trying to think, wow, I have to do what they're doing. No, I don't have to do what they're doing. I should do what I can do. Knowing what I can do and knowing, and doing what I can do. Anyway. That I got through that tune. There was a ballad I was featuring and I felt pretty good. Anyway, at the break, Dave Liebman looks over his shoulder at me. He says, um, what's that mouthpiece you're using? I said, it's a Berg Larson. He just shook his head back and forth. I said, it isn't good? He said, no. Nah. You sound like King Curtis. Like he was giving me this, he was vibing me. Dave Liebman was vibing me. And I'm like, okay, I have a choice here. I could either go into a death spiral. Yeah. You know, like talking about that conversation. Mm -hmm. I could go into a death spiral here and get all depressed. Or I could be like, Okay, that's his opinion. Right. You know, there's things that I really like about his playing and things I don't like. And and I think we hold musicians like musicians that we look up to in such a, you know, on, we put them on such a high pedestal. Yes. But they're, they're, they're human people. just like you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like they're not, they're not a God. Right. They're just, they're, they are, they're, you're, you are them. We're, we're all the same. Yeah. Yeah. We are all the same. Now. Obviously, he's probably put in several thousand more hours of practice than right, I have at yeah. this point. Um, and, and that's Wait, a whole other conversation. Anyone can get to that level. Anybody can. Yeah, and I try to tell students that. I try to explain to them that as how good you're going to be only has to do with how good you're going to or how much you want to be. Right. That's Going really, back to the attitude thing. Right. Get back to, you know, if you really want to do this, then do it. Right. You know, it's just, it's, again... It's simple, just practice. It's mm -hmm. not always easy. Right. It's simple, yeah. Okay, if I'm going to be a really good player, the best thing I can do is practice play three, four hours a day. Mm -hmm. That's not always easy because we have work, we have school, we have assignments. Right, which brings me to, you were saying that 
when he when uh, your saxophone teacher was telling was listing you like everything you should be working on and all these hours that you should be putting in each day for you it might have been a little bit easier considering that you didn't have like the liberal arts classes that you said so right. maybe that was right. your focus right right um for someone that has many different focuses in school and they need to put in that many hours but there are just not enough hours in the day to mm-hmm. do something like that what do you what do you say to that person? Well, if I have a student that comes to me and they're here at Moravian College, and I and I I'm not saying that that kind of the conservatory is better because I think in a lot of ways the conservatory prepared me for a very very narrow job market. Mm-hmm. Okay, and fortunately I was I had enough skills and I did enough other things that kind of broadened me because I think that in a, a, a way. The liberal arts, like we are in here, is really good for somebody that wants to perform because I don't know of too many people that only play for a living. Mm. All the musician friends, even at high levels, some of the greatest jazz musicians that are out there playing, are taking teaching jobs at colleges and universities. Right. And it's not that they can't make a living, it's just difficult and it's erratic in terms of, you know, I'd be busy, I'd be really busy for a few months. But anyway, getting back... If a student comes to me and they're here and they say, you know, I really, really want to, um, I really want to put in the kind of time. I there are things that we can do. I recommend that, you know, we have a lot of opportunities to be in a lot of different ensembles here and a lot of secondary lessons. Maybe the best thing to do there is to pair those back. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. In other words, one ensemble, maybe a large ensemble, maybe a small ensemble. And maybe just one or two lessons that specifically... Re- in other words, we have a lot of students here that can take up to three lessons a semester. And so they'll take guitar, and they'll take drum set, and they'll take voice. Which is all good, and it gives them skills. However, if you are singularity or singular of purpose, which is I want to perform, well then maybe we should set up your schedule in such a way for your lessons and ensembles that you are doing the minimum that will allow you that time in the practice room. Plus, I think... I know that through my experience with that, one of the things that I've learned, and and this is a lesson that I think is a valuable, valuable lesson that I learned in college that goes beyond music, Mm -hmm. and that is I plan every hour of every day. And I still do that. Mm -hmm. Like... I'll I'll know like last night I was planning when I was going to practice today because I have that gig and I know so when I was in college I would practice I would I'm not practice I would set up I knew every day what I would do for that whole day right up until I went to bed and I would use and, and down to all right this half hour I'm going to sit down with friends and watch television or this this hour I'm going to sit down with my girlfriend and have lunch fortunately my girlfriend was also at the school and she was. She understood, right? Yeah, she was a little neurotic about practicing. Right. She was neurotic. She was doing the same thing. She was practicing like four, five, six hours. And realistically, here at Moravian College, you're during the week, you're not going to do four or five hours. You might be able to get an hour, two hours. A great day might be three hours if you have classes and other things. Right. But then maybe the weekends is the day that you knock out the three hours. Right. Maybe it's like Monday, you can only get an hour, so you do your hour. Tuesday, you might get two. Wednesday, you might do an hour and a half. When Thursday might do two, Friday might be only an hour, maybe Thursday or Friday might be the three hours and Saturday or Saturday and Sunday might be that time. And yes, that means that there are sacrifices for my family. Mm-hmm. They sacrifice for my career as well. Yeah. Um, there was a time. They're, they're sacrificing for you so you can sacrifice. For the music. Right. Right. I'll give you an idea or an example of that. When I was... In my 30s, so about 20 years ago, I was I was working on my master's, and I was teaching here only was only half time then, and I was half time at Moravian Academy. I was doing a half time, half time, and then I was gigging at night. So I decided I'm going to go back and I'm going to get my master's because I wanted to have my master's and then eventually get my doctorate to teach in college. Mm-hmm. So I decided, all right, I'm going to take a hiatus, a sabbatical for a semester from the academy. I would kept my half-time job here. So I was teaching part-time here. I would drive to Philadelphia in the afternoon, take classes, and then also I got a call to do a show at the Forest Theater. I don't know if you ever heard of the show Cats. 
It's a Broadway type show mm -hmm. about cats. And but it was but the schedule was this. It was eight shows a week, Monday, uh, Tuesday through Sunday at night, and it would pay like twelve hundred a week. So it was like, all right, the theater is literally two blocks from where my school was. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is come here in the morning, teach lessons. In the afternoon, I would drive down to Philly, take classes. I would play a show at night. I'd get up the next day and I would do this. And it went on for a whole month. And finally, my son at the time, who was three, he said to me, he said to my wife, is daddy going to come visit us at our house? Wow. Like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so it was like, you know, I was... So how did, how did you take that then? What did you do after that? Uh, well, I was in the middle of a, I was in the middle of a master's program. I knew it was going to be finite. Right. Um, obviously practicing at that time was a little rough, hmm. um, but it paid very well. And in order to support the family, right. you know, a lot of other, doing it for them. we're doing it for them. And, you know, eventually, and, and if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here. Right. So there were specific career goals and plans that I had in place. So that's how they sacrificed. There was also a time earlier, about 10 years early before my son was born, where I was doing a lot of gigging and I was doing a lot of teaching. And my wife said to me, you know, you need to be home more. I'll find someone who is. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, Laying it's, down the law. It's, yeah. And it's hard. Musicians, mm -hmm. I have a lot of musicians, friends, that are still doing it. They're on their second and third wives. Yeah. It's hard for family because you're out weekends. And mm -hmm. they're, especially if they're not musicians, it's hard for them to understand. Mm -hmm. That you're going to be out Friday and Saturday night. An interesting juxtaposition. A couple three years ago, I got called from this band that I'm working with now called the Philadelphia Funk Authority. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we had had my son's student loans to pay off, and you know, I had I had gotten this call, and I asked, I said to my wife, you know, they give me a call, and how many gigs a year do they do? I said they do about 90, 80, 90 jobs a year. She said, how much does it pay? And I told her how much it pays. Different than 30 years ago, which was, well, you're going to be home more. This time her answer was, you'll take the job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that means you found the right person. That's right. You know, it's still the same woman. It's just there's different phases in life. But yeah, so mm -hmm. the, the family sacrifices. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now looking at your Moravian years, how has, how has things changed since you started here? <laughs> And what, what, has, what has this school taught you in addition to you teaching people here and educating? What has it taught you? Okay, so when I started here, mm -hmm. I was just a part-time saxophone teacher. I had like three or four students my first semester. That's all I taught. And now I'm department chair. I'm full-time and I'm department chair. So my role here has changed and drastically and become so different. I don't know at that time if I could even imagine that I'd be in this office knowing mm -hmm. who was in the office then. Um, there's been a long, some of the things, the biggest change to me is all the people that have come and gone. I don't mean died, some of them have. Mm -hmm. But, you know, some of the colleagues that I taught with when I started here, I started here in 89, so this is my 30th year of being here. I was in my 20s when I started here. And so there's the, just the change of the people and the people that hired me my colleagues, my role with my colleagues, because when I was here, I was just like one of them part time, you know, and now I'm their boss. Mm. So that's kind of weird. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Yeah. Um, the other changes are just the way I mean, there are certain things that haven't changed. You know, mm. we get really great students. Um, I love the students that we get here. Um, they're, I'm, I'm really excited. I've said this before about this particular class that you're a part of, because mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of really good, fine musicians and very smart, intelligent people. And it's going to be interesting to see. I'm hoping that that's kind of the model of classes to come, you know, that we can do that, replicate that every year. But anyway, some of the changes, the technology is kind of interesting, mm -hmm. the changes in technology, um, because when I came, we didn't have computers. Mm -hmm. If we did, they were like, nobody had to use them. Right. And now it's become such an integral part of everything. Mm -hmm. Everything, all of the registration, things like that was all paperwork. I say that's the biggest thing, sort of the people and the role that technology has played mm -hmm. over the last 30 years and very becoming 
part of everything. I use it in my lessons. I use it in my classes for communication, registration, for administration, for budgets. And that's really huge. You know, people say, oh, the kids today, it's different when I was a kid. I right. really don't think so. I really don't think so. I don't. I don't. You don't, I don't. Think it's, you don't think it's different? or I think that some things change. But politics and those kinds of things, it's always a pendulum. It kind of swings back and forth. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm not a believer in the good old days. I don't think there was ever was such a thing as the good old days. Right. I think that people are comfortable necessarily, especially as they get older with the past, because at least there was no uncertainty because now the past is the past and you know how it's mm. going to turn out. Yeah. You know, there's a certain comfort in that, mm. knowing that. But if you... If you lived during those times, for instance, World War II, we know that we won now. You know, but if you if you had been living at that time, you didn't know that. Yeah. It's an awful time to yeah. live. Yeah. Anxiety through the roof. Anxiety through the roof, you yeah. know. And it so it was not comfortable. No, it isn't. And um and and I I, I really don't believe that you know, students are any different than they were mm. years ago. Mm. So And I think that people who just say the good old days are really just talking about their childhood. Yeah. Because it's it's just what you make of it. Like yeah. being an adult can suck in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways it's it's a good it's a good thing because you're you're a new you're a new person in a way, like you're building like who you are and you have choices about that. Yeah. You realize that you have a choice. When you're a kid, you don't have money choices. No. You go to school, yeah. you eat what your parents make. Right. Everything's you do, you laid go to out bed when they tell you to go to bed. Right. That's why I think when you're a kid, you get bored a lot more. Because you're not in control of what you do. But when you're an adult, you get to that choice. And then you choose things that you want to do. And then time flies faster. Right. You know, it's yeah. not that... It's, yeah, I agree with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so what has what has Moravian taught you hmm. as a teacher or as a person? Maybe it's something a student said or maybe, it's, maybe it was unspoken. Or maybe it's something... Ha, has a student ever said something to you that really stuck with you? That like made you change your perspective on something maybe it doesn't even have to be a student well i'm a firm believer that learning isn't a one-way street in other words i and and i and i this is i mean i've kind of learned some of these skills and honed my skills but i remember taking classes at columbia university for my doctorate that talked about different learning styles and i think i knew a lot of these things but it kind of made it clear um that Learning isn't just in one direction, you know. They Sometimes they call it the banking method of learning. Well, I have the knowledge as the teacher, now I give it to you, now you have the knowledge. Mm. No, I don't believe that. I believe that we construct our knowledge, and we construct our knowledge uh, from teachers, from students, and even from students to teachers. Because I know I've worked with t students that have brought repertoire that I wasn't familiar with. And so they've taught me, oh, wow, this is kind of cool. In other words, I learn almost sometimes as much from the students as they learn from me. Right. Um, and that, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think of something that's... I, I'm a firm believer that all of our experiences teach us something and we take right. from it what we learn. We take from it What's what useful. we want and what's useful and you know it's a little bit contrite or maybe a little bit simplistic but you know i don't know if you ever heard that thing that the chinese word and i don't know how true this is the chinese word for crisis is the same for opportunity huh and so like if something is if there's a big disaster all right so it's a big disaster so you have, always have a choice you can either get down and, and I think you know it's, it's okay to have your feelings about like if you're in a disaster and something or a big disappointment but then at some point you have the choice to say all right so what can I take away from this mm -hmm. and so I think any job and this is the same where you have good days and you have bad days and at any point you use that as a way of all right how am I going to deal with this What's the best way? What can I learn from it? And what am I going to do in the future? Mm. Um, it's one of the things that it's taught me as, as far as specifically Moravian is this job as department chair is a whole new... Universe. Universe, thank you, of responsibilities 
right. managing people, mm-hmm. doing things that I really don't want to do. Oh, right. Times. Because you're not just a musician anymore. You're, I'm an administrator. You're, you're so many things now. I'm an administrator. Yeah. And, you know, like yesterday I was going through this proposal for a new jazz course or making it or, or making a jazz course part of our catalog hmm. and just the nitty gritty details and I hate doing that I learned that right. about myself I hate nitty gritty I'm a big idea kind of overarching kind of person and when right. you get too into the details yeah <laughs> makes my it gives me chills to think yeah. about having to do that <laughs> for instance when I did my dissertation it was 370 pages. I was finished with my doctorate. Everything was approved. Everybody gave. And one of the things I had to do was turn in my dissertation into uh, the office of transcripts, and they were going to put it on the. Uh, they were going to put it on. Uh, have it printed. I have copies of it, like hardbound. Mm-hmm. And I, they t- contacted me and said, you know, your margins are off by a quarter of an inch. Now, do you know what a quarter of an inch margin on 347 pages does? That changes adds the number up. of the pages. That adds up. And that made, so look at this graph on page 220. It was no longer on page 220. Hmm. So I had to literally go back and reformat almost 400 pages. Wow. One page at a time. And it just thinking of it now has given me a headache. Yeah, it was almost I almost didn't get my doctorate just because I had to go back and do that little like review right. or, or or reformatting of all of those thing. details. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. I learned that about myself, <laughs> and that's a challenge for me in this job. That's mm-hmm. a challenge. I put it off. I put it off, mm-hmm. and then just sort of handling the dozens, if not hundreds, of emails I get each day and how to. How am I gonna? I'm still learning after two years of my third year. How do I handle all of this influx of emails and get to people in a timely manner? Because I don't. Mm. That's what I've learned from Raving College. Mm-hmm. Growing up, your musical inspirations were they? Because nowadays it, it is this way, but I think now with the invention of music streaming services and things like that, I think. Younger people are now now have a wider catalog of music readily available oh for them, gosh. Oh and my it's gosh. great, it, like more than ever. And it can be overwhelming. When you were growing up, how much did your parents influence your musical taste, and how did you go about discovering new music? And like, what? How did the radio play an influence on mm-hmm. you? Well, I think this is pretty universal, not just for me, but for everybody. Mm. So I think there's different phases. So when you're growing up and you're a young child, basically all you're pretty much exposed to is your parents' music. Right. Right? So, or older brothers and sisters. Mm. I know for me, my brothers, who are a few years older at that time, we're talking about the late 1960s, were really big into Tijuana Brass. So I heard that a lot. Um, it was interesting because I started taking an interest early on to the old big band music, like the 30s and 40s. That mm. really wasn't something that my parents listened to that much. They were into like country western. Mm-hmm. Um, my brothers, maybe a little bit of that big band swing stuff. And then you start to go to school and your tastes change. And it happens because there's, I hate to get like too preachy philosophical, but you start to break away from your parents when you're preteen to teen years and you start right. developing and part of what you do is you start to identify with your peers with their music mm-hmm. and so for, for me it was Chicago my peers were into Chicago and horn bands in particular Beatles somewhat mm-hmm. but if they didn't have a saxophone I really didn't have that much of an interest in it <laughs> yeah. um, so you know there were some pop things that I listened to um, and then I see this with a lot of people as they get older, then they kind of revisit their parents' music. So it was like that with me. So I listened to a lot of what my parents wanted me to li- or what my parents listened to. Mm-hmm. Then I was, my, my older brothers and sisters had Beatles. My dad didn't like the Beatles. Um, the Beatles, the Tijuana Brass. Um, then I remember I bought this record it was pop tunes and so it was my first pop tune it was like a collection of pop tunes and you're right we didn't have a whole lot um, afforded to us in recorded music I remember going to the store and finding some jazz things Maynard Ferguson Cannonball Latterly some early Charlie Parker when I was in college Um, for me it was early Um, and then when I got into school then I realized that I really needed to listen to jazz more Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah, and you know, you you now 
your generation has this amazing wealth of music that's just a, tap away. Yeah, tap yeah. away. And I didn't have that. And I it was hard growing up in a rural area to find recordings of great jazz artists like Charlie Parker or Sonny Rollins or John Coltrane, especially the vintage stuff, because what was available was whatever was in the record section of a grocery, not grocery store, a department store somewhere. Mm. And I think that even now, even though our generation does have that wide catalog, I think there are people that still can find themselves to what is immediately around them in terms of their music taste and what their friends like. Yes. So... And I think Americans, too, are kind of guilty of being a little bit siloed in terms of, well, I only like two types of music, country right. and western. Right. You know? They're, like, not open to other things. Yeah. They're not... And that, that's always fascinated me, sort of musical tastes, why people are attracted to certain musical tastes. And then often it's interesting, too, watching what happens to students here. They might come in... Like, I'll, you know, I'm really a rock and roll player. I don't really like much jazz or classical. And then they get, they study it and they listen to it more and something changes. And I, th I think it's neurological as well as being sort of just this feeling that mm -hmm. I think that as you age and you become, get into studying music more, you become, you listen to music more and you process music much differently. I'm guaranteeing that after four years of being a music major, your tastes are changed. I mean, your tastes are different when you were five years old watching SpongeBob mm -hmm. than when you were 10 years old, than now that you're 17 and just. Still watching SpongeBob. <laughs> still, well, I, I do too. <laughs> Occasionally. I, I, you know, the vintage ones, particularly. The, uh -huh. You know, the first few years right. are a little bit edgier in some ways. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're a little bit more outside of the box. But yeah. yeah. You know, but. You, you your your tastes change and they continue to change. I remember the first time listening to Wayne Shorter, and this is going back like twenty years, and not getting it at all. And then later, um, after a year or so, putting it on again and and finally kind of sort of makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually, then liking it. Yeah, the first can... time I listened to Charlie Parker, I was like, I don't get this. Mm -hmm. And I think Charlie Parker is one of the greatest players that ever lived. With music streaming services like Spotify and Apple Music, they tend to, what these services do is they cr they'll create like playlists, and like usually it's the first thing you see when you open the app. Some and kind of like, algorithm. Yeah. That, that determines that. Yeah, and while they do cater to your own taste depending on what you listen to on these apps, a lot of the time they'll put out it's mostly top hit stuff when you first open the app, like, you know, Billboard Top 100 stuff pop music on the front page it can often be hard for smaller artists to get a start in this world not just because it's hard because you're a musician and it's hard to start off with that and get yourself out there for most people but what these streaming services tend to do is they take a large portion of the profits from each stream and the artist ends up getting very little mm -hmm. um, in terms of royalties. But at the same time, because it's so easy to use these apps and find artists, even smaller ones, it's both beneficial and harmful to them because they're not making as much money as they could, mm -hmm. but they also have a greater platform to be recognized on. Yeah. So do you think that music streaming services are a curse or a blessing for the music industry or both? I think you pretty much nailed it in terms of the advantage and the disadvantage. Right. Personally, I hardly ever use streaming services. Mm -hmm. So how do you, what, what's your medium then? iTunes. iTunes. If I'm going to be working on a tune or studying a tune, I buy it mm -hmm. and I download it. I want to have it. Mm -hmm. I use, I, I have thousands and thousands of tunes that I've purchased and or downloaded mm -hmm. or loaded onto iTunes from my own CDs mm -hmm. to put on my devices. Um, part of that is just kind of the nature of what I consider to be music scholarship. Mm -hmm. So scholarship, like for a chemist, is to do like experiments and to find out whatever when you're making drugs to make the new drug for cancer, right? Mm -hmm. For me, my, our scholarship, or for music majors, our scholarship is to listen and study recordings. 
and scores. And it's specifically jazz because it's such an oral art form where you should, it's, it's, you should be listening all the time and know the different um, voices of all the different players and all. And so they're going to be specific recordings that I want. And I want them right at my fingertip. I don't want to have to go through. I wouldn't even know how to do that on Spotify and if they mm -hmm. can. And so I don't I do not do much lateral listening other than who I want to listen to. Right. And part of that is just sort of my scholarship, which is, all right, I'm going to learn this tune. Like I'm working on a Chet Baker tune right now. And I'm learning it. I'm singing it along with him. I'll play it four, five, six, seven times in a row and sing along with him, try to match it, and then play it just the way he did it. So that's not the way that Spotify is meant to be used. Right, because it seems like today we're living in a playlist-oriented right. world where we just pick and choose our favorite songs and put them in a playlist. And then and they play do. and then they play tunes that are either your favorite or one that's similar. Right, they all, right. They all, so I don't, do, I don't do my listening that way. Right, and there's, hard, there's less appreciation, I feel like, for listening, like, say, picking up an album and listening it from front to back. Mm-hmm. Like now it's just, it's more like pick and choose. Um, and I do think that there are a lot of people, performers that have benefited from it. Right. And I know bands that will just give free releases of certain things. Here's our music and they just put it out there. Mm -hmm. You're right that it has changed drastically the whole music business. I mean, when I was your age and younger, there was a whole different system and that absolutely had its benefits and its drawbacks. Mm -hmm. There were some really bad things about that system and there were some really good things and then everybody can make a CD now. Well, nobody right. does CDs. Everybody can make a CD or anybody can make their EPs and they can put them on, um, you can put them on iTunes, CD Baby, Spotify, mm -hmm. you know, if you probably did a search on Spotify, I'd come up. And you're right, I'm making hardly any money at all. I might yeah. have like a hundred plays and I'll make like 10 cents. Yeah. You know, and yes. it's, all right, it's, so in that way, anybody that's going into music has to be kind of mindful of how all of that stuff works. You know, I'm at a different point in my career where I've done that. I've put out a few CDs, some jazz CDs, you know, some people know who I am. Not a whole lot. I don't get a whole lot of, a lot of downloads or even hits on Spotify or streaming. Nobody's knocking down my door trying to get mine. Right. My so tunes. Do you think do you think it's harder or easier today to get your music out to the public? Because now we have music streaming services, but the market is also It's easier to get your music out there. The problem is when you have so so it, it can get many choices. It, it's like there's so much noise there. Right. It's hard to stand out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really hard to stand out. And I mean, it's always been hard to know what the next big thing is. And if I did, I put all my money into that. Mm -hmm. Or the next big artist, or the next big yeah technology, music technology. Somebody's making money off of music. It's not always the performers. Yeah, this will be the last question. Okay. Um. What is your fondest memory teaching here at Moravian College? You know, it's not one in particular, but it's sort of the the aha moments that students get in their lesson. Right. When it's like, ah, oh, they get it. Mm -hmm. Or when a, a pro student has a really, really good performance, somebody that I've worked with, and they have a really good performance, that feeling of, of pride. Right. Um, coming back kind of full circle... The, the number of students that are coming in this year and the quality really makes me feel awesome. A really great feeling. Or at the end of a, when, I, when we're, I'm directing the big band at a concert and after, after the last note, the crowd yells. Yeah! You know, like that yeah. feeling is like, that's probably the, the, the best right. feeling I have. Yeah. Although sometimes it's just like going out to lunch with a colleague here too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I enjoy that as well. All right. All right? Yeah, well, thank you so much for Gave you a lot this. of info. Yeah, that was... You're not going to have to type all that up, are you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> no, no, not all of it. it. I no. should have made him answer I'm, a lot I'm shorter. I'm going to summarize, but 